Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for checking out the channel today, The Study of Antiquity and the Middle Ages. As always, I am your host, and I want to welcome you back to Race, Ethnicity, and the Ancient Mediterranean World. Dr. Rebecca Futo Kennedy, thank you so much for coming back on today. Happy to be here. We've covered racism in the classics. We've covered uh, problems with Western civilization. We've explained Black Athena. We've covered a variety of topics relating to modern theories and the way we view the past today. But now I'm going to approach this part of our series, race and ethnicity in antiquity, but primarily focusing on the ancient Mediterranean. And so I'm going to start by asking this question. Ben Nichols asked if you would start by defining race and ethnicity. Yeah, so... Um... I think, I think we have to think about this in, in ways. I'm going to use definitions that are probably a bit more academic, which are rooted in um, long-term study of these concepts. And, and so I think we need to start from the very beginning and say that race is not skin color. That is what we would call sort of common sense, every man interpretation or sort of watering down of the, the history of the concept um, as it developed since the 15th or 16th century. But that is not sort of when we talk about what race and ethnicity are, skin color is not actually the thing. It's, it's and particularly when you're talking about antiquity, um, equating skin color with something that we call race falls really flat and hard. <laughs> um, but we can talk a little bit about how that concept, how, how that sort of use of skin color in antiquity is used and how that then gets buried into modern race um, theories. So I would start by actually saying that when we talk about race, what we actually want to think about is, is race is a concept that is really super modern. So the word itself is French, derived from French, and it's um, something that does, it originally is talking about dog breeds, um, and then it jumps to humans later. Um, but it derives really out of two impetuses in the modern world. One is the um, transatlantic slave trade um, from Africa, and then the other is um, the drive to categorize humans. So this idea is that they want to take, um, they're, they're, they want to take um, the the types of categorizations that you see in Aristotle and uh, and Linnaeus, right, who who picks up later, and transfer for plants and animals what you use for plants and animals, and transfer those types of categorizations towards humans. Aristotle includes humans in his all of his discussions of mammals in antiquity, but he does he treats them as humans. Um, he doesn't, he rarely delves into um, types of humans and he doesn't categorize them as, some, as else, as other. So he does mention Ethiopians and he does mention Greeks. Um, he doesn't really mention a lot of others, but it's very minimal references and it's typically um, comparing them to birds or comparing them to other animals, not comparing humans to other types of humans. Um, there's a few passages, but they're they're really it's like so he's talking if he does talk about skin color this one will probably we'll talk about it later i'll pull it up later but it's important to know when he does talk about skin color he does say that ethiopians and egyptians are both black <laughs> so that one's probably gonna you know freak people out but that's uh just what aristotle says but so we don't want to do skin color but what we want to think about is, is it's an imaginary category that gets developed in order to classify people um really by they're trying to classify people by um continental identities um, but they're doing so um, really within a framework of this transatlantic slave trade and of imperialism and colonization. So race becomes this idea that there is a biological difference in humans, um, in humans who look differently, that is primordial and immutable, um, right? So that it goes all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> and this is an identity that is postulated prior to our ability to actually use science to understand how human genetics work or other things. So it's biological typically in its conceptualizations, but it's an imaginary biology. So if we're going to talk about race, we would talk about race as something that is um, a, a, a constructed category uh, based on an imagined biological ant antiquity that um, is actually used to structure societies into hierarchies. I think that's the actual important part, that it's not race if it isn't being used in legal, social, political, economic structures to embed um, these hierarchies. Otherwise, when you're talking about human differences, it's ethnicity. Ethnicity, we often differentiate between like, oh, biology and, we, and, 
and then culture and language. But in fact, um, descent and kindred are inherent in this concept of um, ethnicity from its earliest stages. Uh, interestingly enough, the word ethnicity is developed in the 20th century. It's a, a um, Max Weber, um, the sociologist, is the first person who comes up with the word ethnicity, and he actually coins the term in German um, in order to use it to have something to talk about that isn't biological race. <laughs> but um, if we look at sort of how ethnicity is, is, is considered, um, kinship is, is a key, or descent groups, but on a much smaller scale. Right? So the idea is that they would share an imaginary past together um, that is represented or manifested in culture, in law, um, ritual practices, potentially shared language, um, etc. Right? So, and not necessarily citizenship. Right? Uh, I think we, we have a problem where ethnicity in the 20th century or in the 19th century um, gets equated to nationhood and the nation state. And that's where you get this conflation of race and ethnicity um, in, and that's why Weber is like, we need a different term to talk about this because we have nations are like conflating all these things. So race, I would argue, is actually the structures that we use to categorize humans by imagined biological differences as a way to structure our societies in hierarchical um, forms. And ethnicity is how people themselves tend to self-identify into groups based on an imagined idea of shared descent, shared culture, um, et cetera. So those are our sort of two working groups, but both of these are modern concepts that the Greeks didn't have. They have lots of words that would fall under this modern concept. There's like in Greek and between Greek and Latin, you probably have a good um, 10 to 12 words <laughs> that can variously be translated as race or ethnicity. So, so, so it's, it's, when we talk about race and ethnicity in the ancient world, we're really talking about a whole range of different ways that the ancients crafted their own and others' identities. And then we're just trying to find the best words in, our, in English, because a lot of us are or in German or in French, like in modern language. We're trying to find the best language in a modern language to capture what they're doing back in antiquity, which is not the same as what, how we structure our societies today. Sometimes we'll see things that are close, right? So if you think about uh, modern racial constructs in America and uh, Jim Crow, for instance, the Athenian um, immigration system, they had a, a group called Medics, M-E-T-I-C-S, not Medics, as in people who are you know, doctors, um, but Metics, Metoikia, um, that is actually a constructed um, category that is basically a legal structure that is meant to exclude anyone who isn't Athenian under the belief that they, anybody who isn't an Athenian and not Greek, but Athenian is biologically different and that any intermixture between Athenians and these other people actually leads to corruption and denigration of Athenianness. So um, this is another thing we really want to think about with race and ethnicity is that not only are these modern words that we're trying to sort of see if those dynamics, how those dynamics play out and trying to capture what's actually happening in antiquity, but when we can't actually talk about Greeks and Romans as a primary functioning identity <laughs> for people, we use those phrases because that's what we call them. But Greeks, of course, is a Roman word. Um, it's what Romans called them. They didn't call themselves Greeks. They called themselves Hellenes. Um, but even then, that was a secondary or even a tertiary identity for them. Their polis identity, or um, if you're a Macedonian, that Macedonian identity, which is actually the Greek word ethnos, is what would be, we would use for Macedonians, um, uh, or Thracian, right? Um, or lots of other things, they use those identities primary to Greekness. And of course, Roman, as I already mentioned, is a citizenship category, not a ethnic category after a certain stage. I have a really cool map of that might be fun to look at for yeah, ethnic groups here. So, so I have this map if we want to sort of think about ethnicity um, as it would function in the ancient world. And here's where I would say race doesn't apply to this stuff. Um, ethnicity is what we want to talk about here. Like I said, race is something we would talk about that are like legal political structures in a city state. So maybe Spartan helots would be a racial category. The Athenian metic is a racial category. Um, in Italy, um, the way the Romans categorized the Latins and the other Italians would be maybe a racial construct. But otherwise, we're talking about ethnicity. And ethnicity, as I mentioned, is often an identity. It's often a group identity that you 
put out for yourself and then you hope other people adopt it, but sometimes they adopt it with names that you might not prefer, right? Um, do the Scythians call themselves Scythians? That's a Greek word, right? Um, for the Romans, they're like, we call the, we, we, they call themselves Celts, but we're going to call them Gauls, right? So, um, but it is still a group that self-identifies. So this is a map that I'm going to share with you that is from, that is made, it's one of my favorite maps. So it takes this really famous, uh, the Apadana at the Palace of Persepolis in, um, uh, is the Achaemenid Persian Palace. And this is where one of the, the locations, the cities where the, the great king of Persia would hold court and where he would accept tribute from all the different people who paid them tribute. And so there's this big humongous stairwell that's like in multi-tiers that leads up to the platform and where the king would sit. And on that thing is a, a, a parade of the different peoples that were part of the Persian Empire um, carrying the gifts that they were known for. So these regional cuisines or regional animals or plant life, etc. cetera. Um, and so someone took the heads of all of these different figures and they made a map out of it. And it's really super cool. All right, let me pull this up here. And this map, like, like I said, they took the heads <laughs> of these different ethnic groups and put them in a map. <laughs> uh, now, in some cases it's weird. So like we have Ionian and Greek, they, they refer to both of them as Ionians, the Persians in their texts. They're the Ionians on this side of the sea and Ionians on the other side of the sea <laughs> is how the Persians refer to them. Um, <laughs> um, they didn't actually have an Egyptian um, on the, on the Apadana. So someone just, they inserted a standard Egyptian iconography here. But these are how the Persians viewed, um, the Achaemenid Persians in the fifth century, um, how they viewed um, the different groups that made up the the membership of their empire right and the persians actually positioned those groups on the apadana so that the people who live the furthest away from them are at the edges and then as you get closer it's the people who geographically live closer to them and they considered the people who lived further away from them to be less quote unquote civilized that's a modern term and the people who lived closer to them to be more like them and therefore more civilized so this ethnocentric view that the greeks had of themselves is something that, that was shared also with the persians and it's also shared with the chinese the chinese have their own concepts of the barbarian but here it's pretty cool right scythians pointy there's two kinds of scythians there's pointy hatted scythians and then there's also floppy hatted scythians i often refer to them as smurfs um but, but you have the sogdians the bactrians uh gandahar right um, people from uh, the Indian subcontinent, right? So all these different groups that show up. Uh, and this is what we would call ethnicity, right? A representation of ethnic groups from the ancient world. So yeah, so it's a pretty cool map. But this is a, this is like, so like I said, race, more like a, a systematic legal um, economic political structuring for differentiating and, and for creating groups that are excluded. It's about exclusionary, creating exclusionary groups. Ethnicity is more like cultural expression and, and imaginary cohesion as a descent group. That is very interesting. I like that map, actually. I know, it's, so, it's one of my favorite maps. Um, and I show the stairwell to the students, and then I show them the map, and they're like, oh, that's kind of, because like, you could put them, you actually put them where they come from. And then you actually see how big the Persian Empire is. <laughs> um, and I should actually say one more thing, just because um, I know we're going to talk about the topic of Egypt, but on this topic of ethnicity, um, there's actually, I'll send you a link for it, but there was a recent uh, little article written at the ASOR, Ancient Near East uh, online journal, on ethnicity in Pharaonic Egypt. And it's one of the places where we can actually explicitly see that skin color and ethnicity are not necessarily, are not linked, even in Egypt. Which is interesting, of course, because it's the discovery of wall paintings in Egypt, which had differentiation of skin colors that gets picked up by, um, in the U.S., by Knott and Glidden. Um, in their volume on the types of mankind to sort of argue for the the permanency and um, and sort of deep past of skin color differences. Of course, they thought the the earth was seven thousand years old, so um, <laughs> humanity was seven thousand years old. So uh, they didn't really go back that far. But this um, article actually shows how um, people who are the, the sort of interconnectedness and the ways in which Egyptians. They did, ethnicity mattered, like, so the difference between someone who's Nubian and maybe Libyan, or what they would call, what they often translate as Asiatic, so someone from West Asia, maybe, that they, they did mark those differentiations, but they also didn't mark them. So we have 
like it, single individuals who are on a tombstone, their own tombstone represented is Egyptian, but then they're on an Egyptian, another person's tombstone represented with as, as quote unquote Nubian um, in their clothing style. And then sometimes you see a hybrid, right? So it's like they're black skin, but in Egyptian um, clothing, but with, you know, different hair or something. And this actually shows you this, this issue of ethnicity as not being an easy category for us to apply from the modern world into the past, because they all have their own different systems and codes. And our job as historians is actually to find out what those systems and codes are, and then try and explain them as best we can. Um, but because the language of race and ethnicity are such, and, national, and, and nation states and nationalism are such hot topics, uh, and such hot button issues and controversial issues in our modern context, um, it often gets um, misunderstood and it often gets misused uh, and the past gets, instead people take the present and project it back onto the past. But Egyptians had their own code and it's different code than Greeks and that's different code than Romans and Athenians had different codes than Spartans or they had different codes than Black Sea Greeks who were living with this, you know, amongst and intermarrying with the Skiffs or the Ionian Greeks who are living in and intermarrying with and and uh, have, have closer connections to members of the Persian Empire than they do to like Spartans or Thebans or others back in mainland Greece. And then of course you have the Western Greeks who are over in Italy <laughs> or who are in North Africa living amongst the Carthaginians and the Phoenicians, um, or they're on Sicily, which is this like sort of melting pot of pretty much North Africa <laughs> and um, the Mediterranean and Spain and Italy and everybody sort of ends up in Sicily. Um, <laughs> so for some reason, everybody ends up in Sicily and Crete as well, right? Those are the sort of two hot spots. Um, so, so yeah, so it's, it's, we have to sort of figure out what they mean. And that's actually really hard work. <laughs> I just think it's really important for us to recognize that identity, like what we call race and ethnicity in the ancient world, that these are not exclusive categories for the ancients, that one can be a Roman and be a Syrian and also be you know, Hellenized, and um, one can be a Greek and an Athenian, and they can be from their deem as well. They can be Egyptian and be Greek. <laughs> you can be all sorts of different things. You can be Nubian and be Egyptian. You can be Egyptian and be, you know, Phoenician. Like, it just, it just doesn't work the way that we want it to work. These are multi-layered and functional identities. They pop out the identity that they need in the context, and we see this on their tombs. We see this on... Um, uh, on legal inscriptions, like if you can, you can find the same person making contracts in Latin, but also their tombs in Greek, right? Or one of my favorite tombs is a Hellenized Jew, probably from Alexandria, who is buried in Rome, but their tombstone is in Greek and it has Greek tragedy masks, and then it has like the the, the shofar and the uh, menorah on it to indicate their Jewishness. But they're in the Roman catacombs using the Greek language, but they're putting Jewish iconography on it. That's <laughs> How it works. Uh, it's not ex exclusive. There's one identity and that's what they have. And this is one of the biggest problems with genetic testing on ancient DNA is that it's trying to find something that isn't actually applicable to the ancient world. And it's actually one of the biggest problems of the studies of race and ethnicity in the ancient world is this idea that identities are, are singular and not multiple.